Welcome back. Uh, I think we're ready for our uh, next speaker, who is Martin Borg Jensen from Gordian Biotech. Uh, he's also in California, so it's uh, also still a bit early. But uh, welcome, Martin. Can you hear us? Yes. Great. So whenever you're ready, you can share your screen, and we very much look forward to your talk. Great. Thank you so much, Martin. Um, so I'll be presenting the work from Gordian Biotechnology, the company of which I'm the CSO, but really um, the credit for everything that I'm presenting should go to the team um, that are all listed here. Um, and obviously, just a second, there we go. Obviously, all of us are uh, conflicted insofar as we're employees of Gordian. So we are a therapeutics discovery um, and development company that's focused on um, diseases of aging. I've been in the aging field for 10 years before starting Gordian. And really the definitive question for a therapeutics company is um, if we have a candidate therapy, um, does it work? Does it do anything? And specifically, does it do anything in the system that we want to change, right? And this is equally true for us and for any other therapeutics company and for anyone in the aging field. Does your um, therapy have an effect on aging? Um, and does it have that effect in the system that you care about? Um, so nothing new here, but we have a problem uh, in studying diseases of aging because uh, generally we don't know what therapeutic um, is going to work. And so typically we run high throughput screens or um, other high throughput ways of finding potential um, effective therapies. But if you're dealing with aging, then um, you kind of have two different options. Option one is if you want to model aging um, for your test, then you can understand aging and then you create a model uh, of aging that incorporates everything that you want, think is important. Um, and then you run your therapeutic tests in that system. Um, but as you know, all of the speakers and probably half the audience, uh, of course, already knows, aging is very complicated. Um, we have seven or nine or however many hallmarks you want to talk about. But the problem is they're all connected and affect each other, and we haven't quite figured out the whole system. And so that makes it very difficult to um, create a model of aging that incorporates everything you care about for um, your disease of interest, whether that is um, COVID-19 or um, heart failure or whatever else. And so there is a second option. The second option is that you do a high throughput screen um, and you do the entire screen in an aged animal that has spontaneously developed whatever disease you are interested in. Um, and as you can probably guess, this is the option that uh, Gordian is making happen. And so we've developed a platform, which I'll tell you more about in just a minute, um, that tests hundreds of therapies for age-related diseases in individual animals. So we put many therapies in and we ask this definitive question, does the therapy have an effect on uh, this age-related disease um, within a single animal? And the data we get out is therefore um, actual, sort of we perturb the biological system, and here is the biological answer to whether the intervention works or not. It's not merely um, we analyzed all the publicly available data, and here's what we think is going to happen, but we haven't really tested it yet. And lastly, very important, um, we can run this big screen um, in something like six months, paying a couple thousand dollars per uh, therapeutic candidate that we want to test. Um, and this is important because, of course, anyone could um, test their therapeutics in a model of aging. You just have to get about 100,000 aged mice together, and then um, you pull them into groups of 10, and then you test um, 10,000 different potential candidate therapies. But to do that in vivo test for even a single therapy, um, on average takes 4.7 years and costs several million dollars um, to get the therapy to the point where um, you can test it in vivo. So if we want results faster, if we want a shortcut, um, then we have to be uh, able to do this fast and cheap. And so now I'll talk a bit about how we do that. Um, first off, we are aided by two different technologies, um, team therapy and single cell sequencing to um, make this happen. And we need this because the problem with a small molecule drug or a um, antibody drug 
is of course that if you put it into your mouse or whatever other model system you're using, it's going to go everywhere. It's going to get into every cell of the animal and it's going to affect everything. And so you can't really put many small molecule drugs into one animal and understand anything about what happens. But gene therapy is different. Um, whether you use viral vectors or something else for delivery, uh, you can deliver nucleotide-based cargoes that will enter specific individual cells um, and affect those cells. And here is a just visual representation of how this happens. Um, at Gordian, we've created a simplified library that just has two different cargoes. One encodes a red fluorescent protein and one encodes a green fluorescent protein, um, put it at low dose into, in this case, a liver. And you can see that individual cells within that tissue have received either one or the other um, intervention. Or in some cases, you can see the arrows, um, you have a yellow cell that has received both interventions, but this is a low number and it's controllable uh, how many cells that is. So with gene therapy, basically we can do controlled delivery of many therapies into individual cells within an animal. Um, and then single cell sequencing comes in um, as our readout where we can take individual cells from that animal. Um, we can sequence their entire transcriptome. So the expression of every gene basically telling us what is this cell up to. Um, and we can couple that with understanding which intervention was in the cell um, using barcoded interventions. So this is just a high level overview of um, how do we run many experiments in a single animal. The workflow that we then pursue um, for our platform is to start with um, a model of a human disease. And importantly here, since we don't need um, hundreds of different animals, we don't have to only work in mice or flies as I did in my past um, or worms we can go into large animal models when they represent human disease better. And we'll get back to that in a little bit. Um, so we have our model organism. We get tissues from both the model organism and from uh, human patients that have this disease. Um, and we use single cell sequencing to basically create a signature of what does disease look like um, in the transcriptome of these organisms. And the reason we include humans here is because you know, try as we might, we still aren't really testing the therapeutics in the system we want them to work in. We can't test directly in humans, um, but we do want to make sure that the model that we use has um, a signature of disease that actually represents what happens in the human disease. So when we have our disease signature, um, next we create a big barcoded library of um, gene therapies each of which targets a different uh, gene that we think the upregulation or downregulation of um, would have an impact on the disease, um, and each of which has a unique DNA barcode. This lets us put the entire library um, together into the organ of um, interest for the disease at a low dose so that most cells in the organ don't receive any intervention. They stay in their sick state and provide a sick environment um, for the therapies that we do put in, right? And in this way, we model um, aging by putting it into an aged animal and um, the full complexity of these age-related diseases by having all of that complexity, having the actual disease present um, around the cells wherein we run our isolated experiments. So we isolate the cells that have received these interventions. We read out the transcriptome and compare it to the signature of healthy and diseased that um, we measured uh, in the beginning. And we check the barcodes. And then we pull together all the cells that uh, have a specific barcode and ask, did this intervention uh, turn the sick cells in the sick organ into something that looks more like a healthy cell? And if it did, um, this is just hit in our screen. And we then follow up and validate that if we put in just this therapy and we now use a high dose so that we try to hit all the cells um, within the organ, do we have a physiological effect, right? So that's just the validation. So this is the platform. Um, how do we know that it works? Uh, for starters, we designed an experiment where we knew the right answer. Basically, um, we could run a screen in a model of genetic disease. So not the disease that we want to cure ultimately, but one where a cure exists and therefore we have a positive control. Um, we can design a library 
where we put in um, the interventions that are supposed to cure this genetic disease um, and others in the same pathway that are supposed to have an effect, along with others that um, are biologically active, but are not um, supposed to interact with this disease. Um, put those into the animal and run through the workflow that I just described. Um, and when we did that, here you'll see a highly dimensionality reduced representation of the full transcriptome. Obviously, we can't model or I can't show you 30,000 axes. So just uh, boil it down to two axes you can see visually. Um, and we see that in the deceased mouse, which is red uh, down to the left, uh, hard to see under the black dot. Um, and in the healthy mouse uh, in orange, top right, you have a, a big difference uh, between the gene expression of cells from these two animals. And then each of our different interventions that has a different color um, is affected. It comes from the deceased mouse, so it starts there. And then the intervention has an effect um, that pushes it in some direction. And some of them are pushed along this primary dimension one up towards what the healthy mouse looks like. Um, and some of them are even worse and many of them do nothing. So when we unblinded this experiment, um, what we see is that the three interventions we put in that were relevant for the disease are in fact the ones that moved up towards healthy, whereas the um, interventions that were not relevant for disease um, were not effective or even were detrimental. And just the statistics uh, along this PCA1 um, are down here. So this validates that we can run a pooled screen in a single animal um, and we can get the hit that we know is a hit. Um, but of course, what I showed you here is just two different dimensions in an unbiased um, PCA. Um, but we get much more information than that. So by using the transcriptome as our readout, we have what I like to call a phenotarget screen. We find the target, but we also have a phenotypic readout that is biologically interpretable. So we can split um, all of the results that we get into many different axes that correspond to different areas of biology. Um, I've just shown four incidentally up here. Um, and we can see that in some of these axes, um, some of our interventions have in fact negative effects. Um, so this disease relevant intervention that isn't quite the right gene replacement has a very negative effect on specific uh, areas of biology, even while it has a positive effect on the main um, issue of this particular genetic disease, MPS2, which is that um, vesicular um, vesicle spill up with um, glycoprotein products. So um, obviously this is not data that is uh, necessarily highly informative um, for disease of aging, since we ran it in a genetic disease, but the same analysis is applied to all of our diseases of aging, where we see individual pathways, are they modulated by um, an intervention or not? Um, and that also allows us to both say, what are the interventions doing and to rationally inform combinations. So with the proof of concept out of the way, um, we are now um, doing work on three uh, lead indications, three diseases of aging, um, specifically NASH, pulmonary fibrosis, and osteoarthritis. So fibrosis in the liver and in the lung, and then osteoarthritis. Um, I won't have time to go through all of this. I'll just give one example of um, the work in osteoarthritis, where, um, as I mentioned earlier, we are using a model that we think represents this disease really well, namely uh, horses that have naturally uh, incurred osteoarthritis by actually living and doing stuff the same way that humans uh, get osteoarthritis. But unlike the way that most um, lab mice get osteoarthritis, which is that you break uh, their knee and then they hobble around and degrade the cartilage. Um, so we teamed up with the University of Florida um, who have a big horse facility. Um, we sourced uh, horses with naturally occurring osteoarthritis, you can see in the middle. Um, we have our gene therapies that are able to deliver um, interventions to individual cells within the cartilage of these joints, you can see on the right. And then we collected these samples from both healthy animals and from osteoarthritic animals, um, did single cell sequencing. Again, this is just a highly dimensionality reduced uh, representation of the data we get. But as you can already see here, there's clearly um, a shift in the cells uh, that are diseased towards new cell states um, that are more inflamed, 
um, hypertrophic, apoptotic, et cetera, all the features of um, osteoarthritis that are well known from humans. Um, so we have the signature, which as you remember was the first part of our screen. Um, we have designed a library um, across our three different lead indications. We have sort of similar libraries um, with four different types of um, interventions in them. Um, we have bottom left in gray, inert controls, so they do nothing. We're gonna control that we can actually do nothing and still have disease cells. Um, we have in blue historical controls. So this is basically everything from the literature and from clinical trials that has been tried for these indications. And we want to demonstrate that we can basically go back and benchmark all of that in a single screen. Um, and we expect some of these to have some positive effects on uh, the diseases, uh, but mainly um, this is just a demonstration. Um, we also have what we call calibration controls, which are interventions that aren't necessarily going to uh, have an impact on the disease um, or a positive impact on the disease, but they are going to have an impact on specific biological pathways. And so for the data I just showed you, um, we can interpret what the axes are. And then of course we have some novel targets. So unfortunately I can't show you the data from these screens because they are currently in the animals um, happening as we speak. Um, but of course what we expect to happen is that we'll have our diseased animals our healthy animals, um, we will have some of our historical controls and novel targets moving up towards healthy, and then we'll have on each axis some calibration controls that help us interpret this. And um, importantly for the aging biologist in me, um, because we can interpret these axes and because we get uh, hopefully some effective therapeutics, we're able to start to understand which aspects of aging biology actually drive pathology of specific diseases. And I think this is really important um, and we'll, I think, go very slightly over time uh, to talk about it because a lot of us are focused and, you know, I used to be focused as, a, as an academic researcher on, you know, how do we target aging? But the problem is that, you know, the FDA doesn't care. The FDA will not approve your drug for aging. You have to find a disease um, to go after. Um, so even though I believe with probably the rest of you that targeting basic mechanisms of aging is important for curing diseases, um, that's not a thing we can do absent a link to the actual disease. And so you see Unity go also going after osteoarthritis for the same reason. Um, but I would like to understand how aging drives diseases. And uh, I think that our platform allows us to do that um, by finding both effective therapeutics and being able to explore them in a systems biology context um, where we can uh, link specific mechanisms that we're targeting to those diseases. Um, so that's the end. Uh, what are we doing now? We're doing these screens. Um, we'll have some data in uh, a month or two. Um, and these screens will demonstrate that we can do high throughput in vivo screens um, in complex diseases in natural animal models um, and open the door to much larger screens, including combination therapies. Um, and of course, talking to pharma companies about pushing these uh, therapies forward. Ultimately, Gordian is a therapeutics development company. We will um, take our hits and we will develop gene therapies for diseases of aging um, across many different diseases of aging. And hopefully by working in these many different areas of aging and finding what's effective in each one, we'll be able to better map out how mechanisms of aging drive these different diseases. So that's everything. And then I'll take questions. Thank you, Martin. Thank you very much for a great and very interesting talk with an, uh, I think, very exciting technology. So I have uh, a few questions from uh, the Slack channel. I think we have time for two questions. The first one is from Matthew Jansen. Within the platform, is there any concern that the neighboring cells are having an impact that would not be seen in the actual disease state? Uh, yes, there's absolutely a concern about that, which we alleviate basically through dosage and statistics. So um, if you have thousands of cells with one intervention um, and they came from all over the tissue uh, and you have overall a low percentage of the cells in the tissue, let's say 1% that get an intervention, the probability that a neighboring cell um, received intervention A uh, and is next to intervention B uh, repeatedly across the thousand cells with intervention B is very low. And we've actually done experiments where we can do that and look at the neighboring cells uh, to confirm. Um, 
And then I have a question from uh, our old friend Peter Sikora, who actually me and Martin used to live with in Baltimore many years ago. Interesting. Uh, he's asking, isn't the effectiveness of the random integration strategy largely determined by how readily a certain cell type takes up the intervention? Hence, an actively proliferating cell would get more of the intervention than a terminally differentiated neuron behind a blood-brain barrier. Um, yes and no. So, you, so we're using um, adeno-associated virus for delivery, which is not dependent on cell proliferation, unlike um, integrating um, viruses. So not a no for the proliferation part, but yes uh, on whatever your virus is more likely to get into. Um, you will get more cells with that intervention. And so typically in these screens, we do sort of one cell type at a time. We'll focus on this cell type and then we'll use a different uh, serotype of AAV to target a different cell type. Very cool. Thank you very much, Martin. I think we will move on to our next speaker, but really appreciate you uh, stepping in here.